Hello and welcome to Superbrain, the podcast for everyone with a brain. My name is Sabina Brennan and I am so pleased that you have decided to join me as I continue my chat with award-winning columnist and writer extraordinaire Hilary Fannin. In this episode, we talk about her books, Finding Forgotten Memories, Fracture, Emotional Territory, Maternal Force and Controlling the Narrative. Let's dive right in. She and I went out for dinner one evening and she just arrived and she just put this book on the table. Wow. And so there's a little gift for you, Sabina, and it's Hilary Fan and Hopscotch, a memoir. Yeah. And I said, oh, thank you so much. That's so nice. And I kind of went home and said, oh, I'll have a little look at that. And I, I just couldn't put it down. Well, it's, it's a superb book, but also because we're of an age mm. and we actually grew up f- literally a couple of miles yeah, apart. apart. Yeah. Um, this was... So yeah. you, you, your story in this is uh, is 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 about, uh, and I just I highly recommend um, that you read it if you haven't read it. I actually we had a WhatsApp group for our fortieth <laughs> school reunion, and I put this in oh, it, and I said, guys, you. read this because it's it's our child childhood. Now it's it's very much your childhood. What's it interests me from a number of of levels. Obviously, it was very personal because, you know, hearing things like low babies and high babies yeah, and, yeah, you yeah. know, all those funny things that, yeah. that we had. Yeah. Um, but it, this is wonderfully written from a child's perspective. Mm. And it's about you trying to make sense of, of very big and serious issues in the world around mm. your parents and your father. And mm. your father was having an affair for about for, for probably the best part of 20 years my yeah. goodness yeah. and and which was incredible because he would bring you along when yeah. he was meeting his special friend yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. so it's it's wonderful story from 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 that perspective but also I'm interested in it from another perspective and I think also having read some of your other articles as well I think it's something that interests you which is the concept of memory mm. and so this is a memoir yeah so this is you know something that has come from your brain and how your brain has created this mm. this memory and I'm interested to know uh, you know how you got there like I have I really just have snippets from my childhood mm. I have some really some really strong memories and mm. moments recently um I I went to visit actually um the town where my father grew grew up and I went mm. to, to to find his house and whereas I'd been just thinking of an address, as soon as I walked onto the street, I remembered, oh, my God, because mm. we thought it was my son was with me and he said, that's the house. And I said, no, it's not. There's only one window on one side. I remember we would go in the door and the housekeeper, mm. which was his second wife, um, mm. uh, was down in the back there in the kitchen. She always hid when his the kids mm. and grandkids from his first family came. And my granddad was into the left sitting on the thing. But the memories that, mm. that came and I went, can we go down the road? There's a river, there's a canal and there was yeah, a bockety yeah. bridge I was afraid of. But uh, in writing your book, like you have these memories, you, you brought mem- memories back to me, but that's because you sparked them for me. Mm. How did you find those memories to write with such clarity mm. about mm. them? Mm. I know you said one line somewhere. Once I began to feel, mm. I could then write. It's, it's, Does I that think make sense? we. I think we. Like you described last night, going to the location and using location and maps um, is is a tool that a lot of memoirists will use. Mm. It can be quite interesting if to use a literal map, a physical map of a territory, in order to um, to spark memory. Um, And Carlo Gebler, for instance, who's written extensively about his childhood, he's the son of Edna O'Brien. And he will use physical maps, and Ernst Gebler, uh, he will use physical maps to kind of, um, to, to, to wake up his memory around territory. For me, the territory was emotional um, and the territory was internal. Um, So I had... I had looked in my, the first play that I wrote was called Mackerel Sky. And I had looked at fracture within a family and an absent father and and financial turmoil really was what the play was about. Um, and so in Hopscotch, um, it, it, the, the, the territory is very, very similar, you know, 
but but I think the main thing was a and I think this is really important I was given permission to do that Mm -hmm. by a publishing company and an editor who said I met them I had lunch with them and I said this is what I think I'm going to write about and they had thought I was going to put a collection of columns together all right okay and I said yeah I know that's not a bad idea etc etc but actually I'm thinking maybe could I write this and they said yeah go for it wow so first of all permission Mm -hmm. first of all somebody saying yes that's okay yes it's okay to tell your story yes it's okay to be heard it's okay just do it Mm -hmm. and then like you I had an insanely tight deadline but again that felt real right Mm -hmm. that felt contained that felt actual and so the only thing I had to do then was find myself as a child and ask her to bring me around okay so I remember the fr- and I turned up to the desk and I remember the literally thing to myself right um there are because I've been writing for a couple of years now and especially in terms of writing to deadline for the Irish Times and stuff I figured okay so let's boundary this I'm always talking about boundaries yeah let's boundary this let's give this five years you know let's take it from the time you were I went to Manor House School in Rohini when I was four and they expelled me when I was 11. God. So that was, what, uh, f- seven years? Yeah, something? yeah. So I thought, OK, right, great. So that's that's clear, right? That's seven years, right? Yeah. From the time you went in till the time they threw you out. That's seven years. So let's focus on that. And it was also a time of tremendous... Um, <laughs> it was a dynamic time within my family mm-hmm. when a lot of stuff happened. And at the same time as I was expelled, the bailiffs came, knocked down the door, took all the furniture, took all the clothes and we were homeless. So the, I knew the end, mm-hmm. you know, so then I really had to think, OK, so and then I figured begin on your first day in Manor House as a low baby. And the confusion of this shoe box, which I'd never forget, shoe bag, you know, because mm-hmm. we had indoor shoes, outdoor <laughs> shoes, plimsolls and ballet shoes. And then the corridors were had blue tiles, black tiles and white tiles. And you could walk on the white tiles in your plimsolls and your ballet shoes, the blue tiles in your indoor shoes and the black tiles in your outdoor shoes, right? <laughs> and you're four. <laughs> and you're four. And like, this is an absolutely mind-crushing <laughs> puzzle for me. I can't, I think I'm numerically dyslexic. I can't right. manage numbers at all. Yeah. And um, But even if you could, that's yeah, extremely but complex my brain, and beyond. My brain was like fried, you know. <laughs> Like on day one, I just thought, man, this is just really tough. So anyway, so I just went back there and I saw there was a girl in, I can't remember what I called her in the book. Her name was Odette. And she had curly hair and she could sing. And on day one, oh, yes, she it's sang. A hole in the bucket. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if she sang that one, but whatever she sang. Yeah. But when I sat down at my desk, I saw Odette. And I thought, oh, I... And I thought, oh, man, I'm, I'm there. Right. And then it was really just walking around with Billy. My father, my family called me Billy. Right. That was very useful to me as well, because people stopped calling me Billy when I was about, I don't know, nine or ten or something. Why do they call you Billy? Uh, Hilly Billy. Hillary, oh, Hilly Billy. Hillary, oh, right, Hilly Billy. okay. So Hilly I was Billy, Billy the silly Billy yeah, or something. Yeah, but yeah. I was just Billy. I was called Billy. My whole, I didn't know my own, my name was Hillary. I thought my name was Billy. I also thought that my father was my father and not my siblings' father because I thought every child had one father and that mothers were just kind of pods. But anyway, that's <laughs> neither here nor there. So, so because I was Billy mm-hmm. in the book, I just found Billy, right? And Billy brought me around. Okay. So she brought me the whole way through. Right. And and it's wonderful. But you know the thing is, people would, a lot of people said to me after the book was published, "Oh my God, how do you remember all that stuff?" Yeah. And I was saying to them, "You too have all of these memories." I think it's a matter of just allowing ourselves to open the door. Yeah, we just walk in. Yeah, I, I mean it's interesting. Memory is fascinating. People tend to think that memory is just one thing, like a unitary thing. Yeah, but yeah. we've lots of different types of memory. Yeah. And um, I mean, I often say that you know, as people get older, they get concerned about losing their memory, yeah. uh, and it's a big fear. And, and it's something that you know <coughs> happens right. with uh, with dementia and, and creates mm. all sorts of loss for family uh, mm. as well. But the thing is, and and it's what's really interesting and nice about what you said there is you know as children 
before you're four. And actually, I should say to anybody who's listening who's not from Ireland or understands, low babies is just the first, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the first step into school. In, in Ireland, actually, we start school at four. Yeah. And in other countries, you know, from four to six, you're probably in a kindergarten. So yeah. they would be the first two years of school and we, they were called low babies and high babies, which really is probably the equivalent in other countries of a kindergarten. And yeah. then first class is probably yeah. real big school, but yeah. tiny, tiny little, Tots, not much more yeah. than than infants. And you had to sit down with your lava tratna and, and, and your uniform and your uniform and not touch anything. And, and, and that brings me yeah. to my point around memory, actually, before we go to school, you look at any child or infant and they explore the world through all of their senses. Mm. Things go in their mouths, they smell things, they taste things, they touch things, they roll mm. on things, they nuzzle into things. Mm. So they're exploring absolutely everything. Um, and it's wonderful. That's how they progress so fast. Mm. They learn by interacting with the world. Mm. And then we go to school and we're made sit um, in one place, close your hands, don't speak, um, fingers on don't, lips. F- yeah, fingers on your lips. Don't, don't, yeah, that's it. Fingers on your lips. Uh, we actually used to have to you'd cross your hands and put your hand your, your lips. And then <laughs> sometimes we had to teach you and you had to cross your hands behind your back because she liked you to sit upright and straight. Uh, you weren't allowed to move. You weren't allowed mm. to jiggle. You weren't allowed to do anything. Mm. And basically everything was taught to you hourly. Mm. Um, and, and so then through through language and and that's just one aspect of how memory is created Mm -hmm. and if you're that poor child who doesn't that's not one of your greatest skills you're screwed just terrible you you really just are screwed Uh, and we all learn in different ways Mm. um but when it comes to creating memories the more senses you can use Mm. the more access you have to those memories Mm. and that's particularly important because we learn in school we learn through language by rote um, that if in later life, if your access, if your pathways, your neural pathways through language become damaged, whether, you know, it's through a disease like dementia or for, for, for other reasons, um, you're, if that's your only, you know, way you form the memory, that memory is lost. If yeah. you enrich your memories as you encode them by noticing the smell, and I guess this is something that writers do instinctively anyway, mm-hmm. you know, it's part of your it's part of your your craft really is to to explore the world with all of your senses, because then yeah. that's how you recreate it on the page. You know, you have the smell, the scent, the you know, what it evoked yeah. and all sorts yeah. of things. But if you want your memories to stay and, and to access them, use all of your senses. And similarly yeah. to what you just said yeah. there, and, and that's your emotions, too. So we know for sure emotional memories uh, are embedded more strongly. Yeah. And it involves the amygdala in your in your brain and your hippocampus taking in the information is also quite near to your amygdala, very deep in your brain. Um, and it makes sense for emotional memories or very salient memories to be embedded um, more importantly, because mm. actually if they've uh, stimulated fear or yeah. or, you know, um, or, or joy, even yeah. you want to either not replicate or avoid, yeah. do, you know, yeah. so it kind of makes yeah. sense. So that's probably you know, that probably really helped with your memoir because it was such an emotional period of time. The the thing I think that I think my position in the family um, fed into that as well, because I was the youngest by quite a bit. Okay. because my siblings were 10 years older, nine years older and eight years old. So Laura, Valerie and Robert. And in the book, I call them by their middle names, Louise, Anna and John. Right. So the real names are Laura, Valerie and Robert. Um, They were like steps of stairs. And then... Eight years later, I was born. Right. I was a mistake. So and like an only child. Yeah. So I was, I, f- I had a kind of um, position of observing them. Any, like, I felt like I was born into a, tr- like, there was an, a pre-existing tribe. Like, right. it wasn't forming as I was growing. It was there to be understood. Right. It already existed. And I think that's why I created the space in my brain to to be and to store memory and to to bring a bit like you know an animal would bring something into its lair and look at it and try and figure out what the hell it is you know what I mean I I would hear conversations at home and you know they were like like Laura was 10 you know as I said and you know so by the time I was like four and five they were like teenagers you know Mm -hmm. they were 15 whatever can't do the math but um the so there was a lot of information that was very difficult to 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 calibrate, you know, that was coming at me. 
And my parents were very not, they wouldn't have been, you know, they wouldn't have passed any childcare tests or mm-hmm. whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, and so, you know, there was no, there was no dumbing down or dilution of their emotion or anything else in the house. Yeah. We, and so you just, you took all this stuff into your lair and you tried to figure out, you know, what does this mean? But I, that, that's what we do as humans. We, we, we try and figure stuff out yeah. and we make up stories to, to make to that facilitate stuff. them. Yeah. yeah. Now we do that. We do that as adults. Like yeah. we continue to do it all, all our lives. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's really important to, mem- to remember if people yeah. get stuck in places or, you know, feel anxious or depressed. You've just created a story about the world around you. And since you've created that anxious story, you could also actually change that and story create a different in some way. Story. Create a different story. Because that's all we do is we create a, a story, narrative to, a narrative we're to make sense. we're imposing narrative on our lives. And, Absolutely. You know, the, the privilege of being allowed to write a memoir is you get a chance to actually, actually control the narrative. Mm-hmm. You're controlling the narrative. You know, it's like filmmakers making movies about, you know, so much of you know, autorial work is part partially autobiographical. You know, you're creating, you're putting a narrative on your on your life, and it's a privilege to be able to do it. But it exists for all of us. That's the point. Everybody can do it. You don't have to put it down on paper and for it be a book. That's amazing yeah. if it happens. But it's a lovely power that you yeah. that you have. And similarly, yeah. as you just said, and I'm going to try that actually, <laughs> is kind of go back and actually, you know, go. Ribena actually is the, the, the name that, yeah. that people used to call me or rags, t- rags, rags tails are something that people used to slag my hair. I'd, I'd hair down past my bottom. Mm. And it, I don't know if your mother did that. She used the, to tie them in the, the nylon ring- stockings. Yeah, but they didn't quite, yeah. quite come out as ringlets. Yeah, you know, yeah, they yeah, were yeah. kind of rat's tails. That's what they called me, rat's tails and then Ribena because Sabina reminded you know and I didn't like either of them they weren't particularly you know kind of nice ones but um, I must do that journey now that you've just said and see if I can find more memories I have some obviously you know kind of big ones I remember I I remember wanting to go to school like you I was the youngest of five um, and my sister was 10 years older than me and then so it was 10 9 six and three or something so yeah. we were yeah, steps yeah. the stairs but I think with three boys in between there yeah. was yeah. kind of like that my sister then was you know Ten kind of always yeah, yeah yeah there was, there was a gap and similarly I think it's I think it's of an age because we weren't parented um no you know we I mean I, my mother was at home full time um, and my father had a job um but there was no parenting there was never conversations around you know you yeah. know, is this good? That good. there was rules. There was a lot of rules. Yeah. Certainly in my house, you can't do this, you can't do that. And <coughs> and you Sorry. were and I often wondered whether that was why I was drawn to acting as well. Yeah. This is how you behave. This is who you are. You know. And I think yeah. you come out of it. And a lot of people our generation kind of grew up in a way not knowing who we are yeah. because there were so many rules. There were so many rules, and and it was you have to behave this way in this situation and this way in this situation, yeah. and you no know, sort of sense of self. Yeah. And I suppose part of that is growing up as well. And that's what's lovely about when you do come into your fifties, if you you really do start to get to know yourself at yeah. the core, who yeah. you really are, and what really matters. And and that's joyful. I say to people like, we have this horrible age of society where people worry about getting older. You know, your twenties are really hard. I, I, I really <laughs> don't worry about getting older. I right. mean, I I. I you know, I feel a great sense of um, freedom being yeah, this age. I do too. Much freer you know? than, than than I've ever felt. Yeah. Um, I did want to talk to you then. I, I mean, I had the pleasure of reading um, your novel, oh, yeah. uh, The Weight of Love. Um, and again, um, uh, this uh, this is an incredible read. Uh I again started to read it. Um, I think I read it in um, I would have read it in one sitting, except like it was half three. <laughs> like I started in in the evening time and I, I, I closed the covers at, at 3.30 a.m. and said, wow, right, I need you. to go to sleep. And then I started reading again the next day and 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 finished it. Um, I, would you would, would you like to kind of. Well, I'd, I'd never written a novel mm-hmm. and I'd written a memoir and I'd written plays and I'd written uh, columns and articles and stuff like that. <clears throat> and uh, and then but again, I was given permission by the publisher who said, we'll take a, another piece of work from you. Oh. Um, after Hopscotch, they said, look, we'll 
we'll we'll take something else if you like and so that's it's a lovely know, place to be so i'm so lucky that that mm. happened i didn't have to fight for it you know um now can i just go back because i do yeah. think that's something that yeah, that, that a lot of us say is i'm so lucky and 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 the thing is no you demonstrated your talent that's not that's actually not luck. That's you demonstrated your talent through all your writing over the years. And they went, whoa, this person can write. And you know what? We can trust her enough to to decide well, what she wants to write. You. That's yeah. not luck. I, I, yeah, no, I know. I mean, I, it's hard yeah. to say it sometimes, yeah. you know, and, and it's, it's hard. Like, and, it, and there's a fear. Yeah. Anyway, I said, mm, what is that fear? I, I'm used to being, you know, just a really quick back to the high baby, low baby thing at that point. I was told I was weak, mm. you know, and that word has followed me around my entire life. God, you know. know, the power of those yeah. childhood. And, you things. know, you're you're not capable. You're weak. And you're. And so then as a teenager in school, I just was a bit wild because, you know, if you're going to be weak, you may as well be wild. Mm. But anyway, um, so, yeah. So the weight of love. Um, so something you said earlier about the hippocampus and the other one. The amygdala. The amygdala. So somewhere between my amygdala and my hippocampus or whatever, <laughs> whatever, um, I've been carrying around a couple of stories, a right. couple of ideas. And there was one idea that kind of kept that stayed with me, a couple of ideas that stayed with me. And so then they and I don't really know what the idea where the idea really came from, but it's it's a memory and it's bits of thinking about. I was thinking a lot about how fast life goes and how we make decisions when we're younger that have massive power and influence over our lives as as they pan out. Not that we could have made any different kinds of decisions because we were young, because we don't have the power of hindsight. Mm -hmm. I thought a lot about memory. I thought a lot about how we can freeze something in an aspect, in aspect in our memory, how we can almost almost we can like store it in a kind of museum like it's funny you said as uh, aspect aspect yeah. which is like a clear jelly yeah um and you know when you get into real detail around memory there's um memory has been defined in lots of different ways you know through psychology or whatever but one way they look at some memory is uh, crystallized yes and okay. fluid and, yeah. and it's that's more around intelligence but it's about those yeah. things that are more fixed yeah. and those things that are more fluid yeah and and I, I think in this book as well uh, it, it, kind of what you're just saying there it it's that believing that something is fixed that actually it isn't, isn't fixed, fixed yeah. but you've yeah life has that's become one of those it's, big moments and that's, that influenced and everything that's else that's become frozen in yeah. some kind of or it's been held in some kind of aspect so the character ruth for me she she you know she's very you know she's fine she's mm. absolutely fine you know she has a a grown-up son she's married um she lives in dublin but there is this one um person in her life and it's there is this unresolved there is a sense of loss and and there is no resolution around something that happened to her in her past so a series of events happen and she goes back to the scene of the crime in many ways and she unpacks i hate that word um her her own mem she traces her own memory back she mm. makes herself go back and actually look in the cold light of day at this person that in many ways she had kind of deified, mm. glorified, mm -hmm. had allowed to become um, a much bigger part of her life than he should have been. But she it's not just that she allowed him to become a bigger part of her life. Her husband allowed him to become uh, a bigger uh, part of their her, life. Too. Her husband was connected into this yeah. man as well. Yeah. Yeah. And he allowed that. And other circumstances kept Joseph alive for, mm -hmm. for, for that family, mm -hmm. if you like. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. You know, the other thing is like, it's kind of, um, I also wanted to, I just wanted to be truthful and human and, and funny and bits of the book are funny mm -hmm. and bits of the book are sad. Um, and because bits of the book, it's very human, you know, they're, totally, they're, they're, yeah. they're really, really, that's what I love about it. They're really human characters. It's very universal. It's set between Ireland and London, but it's yeah. universal because it's about There's two time frames. There's the mid nineties and the present day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, it's 
there's 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 lots of characters in it all mm. all all extremely um Helen. all extremely interesting all interrelated um and in a way it's kind of i suppose when i was reading it you know you you are reading it about love and relationships um between mm. couples and the funny thing though and i'm i'm really just love to ask you about this when i closed the book and mm. finished it and you know in that moment where you kind of go god it's finished and you still want to be there in it you know um and i was really thinking about it because some of it really resonated with me you know mm. particularly around um joe ruth and robin mm. um mm. Uh, one line actually really i uh, stayed with me and i can't even remember who said it but the underestimation of being a nice person. I think Robin is a nice yeah, person, yeah. a good person, kind. a kind person. Yeah. Uh, whereas Joe is this, flamboyant, you know, flamboyant, yeah. interesting, arty, not mm. very nice person, mm. really, and mm. um, very self-centered um, and with his own human, you know, he, he's mm. not a bad guy. You know, that he has his. Mm. And that's what's lovely about the book is, mm. you know, you get richness, three dimensional mm. all from all angles mm. of mm. of this. Um, but that's what really, really jumped out at me. And I don't know whether it's media and television and all those things leave us to underestimate how wonderful and beautiful really good, nice people are mm. and how that can be the most valuable mm. love. And Robin is not, um, I mean, Robin Robin has is a complicated man. He's mm-hmm. a very complicated man himself, but he has um, some, he's kind. He has kindness. And I think it's Ruth who says, you know, people underestimate kindness. I never did. Yes. And and I think that I, without spoiling the book, I, for yeah. me, that's a, a sort of a really pivotal yeah. moment in the yeah. book that jumped yeah. out. I just yeah. couldn't remember exactly how the line is. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, when I closed the book and thought about it, I'd been reading it as a book about relationships and was totally drawn in and very in, you know, in the moment and mm-hmm. and and. Uh, you know, there wasn't sometimes you read books and you go, oh, why did they do that? That's really stupid. They shouldn't have done that. Mm. And it's it's like it's set up that way. But for every action, whether it was a silly thing to do or whatever, it made sense for that character to have taken that yeah. route or, or road, which was lovely. That's what I mean by yeah. about it being very human um, rather than sort of orchestrated to get to the end of a yeah. plot or something. Yeah. It was yeah. just real people. Um, but I closed it and I thought about it and I thought of that. Actually, I think that is a book about mothers. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> very well read. It it And I, you know, I'm glad no, you but kind I, of said yes. Yeah, no, no, very well read. I, I you see, mm, I don't know. I don't know how other people write, um, but I don't know. I just sit down and start mm-hmm. and then just see what happens. Right. OK, so I don't know. I carry a story around. I have a sense of the story. I have a sense of the people, but mm-hmm. I don't actually know what they're going to do. Right. You know, but I had I would be a, have an awareness of them. And when I finished the book, I said to myself, man, this is a book about mothers. Right. That's literally what I yeah, said. Yeah. So and it is because they all have they mothers. They all have mothers. <laughs> and the mothers are very, but you see, you know, when you're an actor or a writer, you kind of, you have a plumb line. Mm-hmm. You you hold a plumb line in over your character. You mm-hmm. know, if you're playing a character or writing a character, you want that character like no more than you want your wall to be straight. You want an emotional plumb line that is travels through that character so that their actions, they may be odd actions or idiosyncratic actions, but they're based in truth. They're held in truth. Right. So the plumb line is a line of truth that pulls through each character. So we're Ruth, Robin, Helen, um, all of Joseph, I love Helen. And actually. Helen, I love She's Helen. Lovely. Helen is great. And Helen just kind of walked into the book and said, "Actually, I'm in it. Yeah. So just move over." And you know what? You I have, have a story. <laughs> yes, and you know, would you mind? <laughs> but um, anyway, so the plumb line. There's a kind of truthful line, but that truth is rooted in the relationships with, with their, their mothers. mothers, and they're not easy relationships, really, any yeah. of them. But they're very truthful relationships. And of course, when I look back in it, like this is the book I kind of finished and and um, kind of stuck together when I was doing the M Phil in Trinity. Right. OK. And I walked into that M Phil two weeks after Mary died. Right. And began to really allow myself to write this book. Okay. So I was going to write about 
I was going to write about uh, that maternal force Mm -hmm. in our lives, Mm -hmm. whether for good or bad. I am a mother myself. I'm, Mm -hmm. you know, critical. That's a weight of responsibility that we feel, I think. Yes. You know, so so looking at that central relationship, the weight of love is a, is a kind of a love story with no romance. Mm-hmm. This, that is not a romantic book. It's a very truthful book. Yeah. But the, their psychology is. It's it's is there. I, I have to say, I, I, I really I, you know, I just loved it for its truth, honesty. I think so many of the characters will resonate with people. The situations will resonate We've with been people. There, we? We've been there. I could go, oh, people. God, ordinary people. Exactly. But I, 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 the thing is that it is that book. You're on that journey with them. And it's only afterwards that you realize it's a story mm. about mothers, mm. that, which and I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but it's mm. it's a wonderful journey um, to go on. And oh, it's called so The, much. It's the so Weight sweet. of Love. And, and, and I really, I really, really um, enjoyed it. And I just want to talk briefly again about your um, your, your mom and memory, because mm. um, uh, you wrote recently, um, I think just towards the end, your mom didn't mm. recognize you. My mom had. Uh, dementia and people often said that to me is it awful mm. that your mum mm. didn't recognise you now my mum never didn't recognise me yeah, you know yeah, dementia yeah. takes many shapes and forms yeah. um, but memory is 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 a very strange thing yeah. you know we think it's one thing and, and um, I, I read one of your pieces and, and, and what you'd written um, and if you don't mind I'd like yeah, to, yeah, to read it sure. out because um, I think it's right on the money and there's one word in it that I had to actually look up in the dictionary and, and I actually have it written here in front of me folks with <laughs> together with the how you pronounce it <laughs> but the piece was um, uh, so did your mum die in 2017? Yeah. Yeah in the summer so yeah, this is written right. in the December so um, the title um, um, of the article is Memory is an Unreliable Friend, a Drunk in a Bar. And that just grabbed me straight away mm. because it, it is on the money when it comes to memory. And, and this paragraph you have. But memory is a tricky, quixotic, quixotic yeah. uh, friend. Memory is moody and unreliable. Memory forgets. Memory is a downright liar. Memory is a country with an inhospitable weather system and some very dodgy politics. Memory is a drunk in a loud bar. One minute you'll be head in, held in her sentimental embrace. The next she'll have a broken glass at your juggler. And even though you know, even though you know that as soon as you turn off the cutting room lights, memory will rearrange itself. You know, too, that memory is all we have. Mm. that it to me that's just an amazing okay. it's an amazing piece of writing but it is so um it's so on the money from a neuroscience perspective <laughs> from a psychology perspective um you know that that that's it memory is changeable and, yeah. and and memory is not the thing that we think it is but it is all we have um but we can manipulate it we can yeah. explore it we can tear, yeah. tease it apart and um, it can destroy our lives it can make our lives yeah. but there is we have control yeah I, it's a country i think mm. memory is another country it is a country it is the country that i inhabit mm-hmm. you know it, it, it's where i live a lot of the time yeah but yeah, but, but, but it's okay but yeah. Yeah, you can. Uh, but a lot of people don't explore that country yeah. uh, or don't know that country or aren't familiar or yeah. are afraid of it, you know. Or they take other people's narratives around it. Oh, you were that. I tell you what kind of child you were. Yes. You know, I mean, I was told I was a stupid child and I was a loud child and I was this, that and the other, you know. And I just think, well, you know what, I'm I'm. They can be your. They, these they are can not be your my memories. memories. Yes. My my narrative, I own my memory. Yes. I own my memory. My sibling, I have, you know, I'm close to my siblings, mm-hmm. my three older siblings. And we sat around a table in Spain during the summer because my sister lives in Spain. One of my sisters lives in Spain. And um, some stuff came up about the past because, you know, we we kind of pedal in the past, you know, when a cup of glass of wine and yeah. we're right back there, you know. And um, my brother disagreed very much with a memory that I had about a time my father's lover's husband threatened to come shoot. down and shoot, shoot him yeah. and he had a gun and he rang so the husband of my father's lover rang my mother and said I'm coming down Mary to to shoot him I have a gun 
And uh, is he home? Because I'm coming down to shoot him. <laughs> and Mary said, oh, God, listen, you know, whatever. I don't mind. I mean, honestly, please be my guest. But, you know, uh, Billy's going to be, um, it's going to kill her. So we were talking about that. And my brother said, no, 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 no. It wasn't that. He said he's coming down to kill him, to kill Bob. And Mary said, be my guest. But what about the children? Right. It will kill them. Right. And, you know, I'm sure I don't know who's. It does it matter? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. Yeah. My memory is that it was about me. Yes. So what? And you know what? That has probably got something to do with your age at the time. Because yeah. we don't get that sense of right. other people to exactly. look into our teens. Exactly. And that's so interesting to say that because as the person I was then, like I was 10 or 11. Yeah, you wouldn't I'd have just been expelled sense. from yeah. school. The house, had, the bailiffs had taken everything. We were living in this kind of summer house on the edge of a cliff. There was no furniture. Was, everything was bananas. And then this guy was coming down, you know, who I liked. I knew yeah. him and he was a terribly nice man. Um, my husband, father's lover's husband was a very nice man <laughs> and he was heading down to shoot you know this I adored my father I, yeah. he could do no wrong you can wrong. see that in the I book. absolutely yeah. loved him in it and but I have to be able to say that that's okay to have, you know because as a as a woman of 57 almost 58 I look at his behaviour and I think man what were you doing yeah. what were you doing that was not okay mm-hmm. but the me that was there with him, you know, he was he was wonderful. Yeah. He was my world. Mm-hmm. So, yes, you hear as a child, you hear I heard me mm-hmm. and my brother heard them. Yeah. And that's fine. And that's fine. And I, th- I, I think that's important. I don't think it's something that we should argue about. The thing is, yeah. our memories are our memories, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and that's our truth. Um, and then if those if that truth is causing you a problem, well, then revisit it yeah, yeah. And, and, and you can kind yeah, of yeah, change yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do, do you know, because yeah, yeah, the yeah. thing is, you know, like yeah. people think eyewitness testimony, you know, oh, but they saw. But actually, it's the weakest testimony you yeah. can ever have, yeah, yeah, yeah. because all you need is put four people in a yeah. room and, they, and they'll see things from yeah. different perspectives, yeah. different angles. Yeah. We don't see things in 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 um, a bubble. We bring things with us, yeah. you know, um, uh, it's incredible. Two people can witness people talking. One can say they were having a, a terrible argument. Some were saying, "Oh, they're so passionate about each yeah. other." It, you bring you bring what you've had, and and you create yeah. that story. Yeah, um, totally. And I think in that lies a certain power, um, because a lot of people feel life happens to them. Yeah, but it it doesn't. You no. make life happen. Yeah. And yes, you know, sometimes y- you really get thrown, you know, yeah. some awful stuff. Yeah. But it's what you do with the stuff. Yeah. Your throne that kind of makes yeah. a difference. Yeah. Um, I think uh, it's just been absolutely fascinating talk to you. I think I could talk forever. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, I just would, if there's any, I think you've you've given us a few gems actually throughout. If 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 you can recall them, if there's mm. any tips um, that you'd like to leave listeners mm. with, mm. Um, you've kind of talked about a few things there around. Um, I mean, I think that the you know I, I. You know, without sounding very syrupy about it, I I really appreciate being alive. I really appreciate having the day, mm-hmm. having it and having the next day and the next. And my all of my siblings were very have been chronically, critically, all of them have had cancer and all wow. of them have had have survived in the last um, 10 years and. Um, my family's in a cancer cluster, they call it. Wow. Um, it's neither here nor there. But the the thing is that I really appreciate the time. I, I really appreciate... Being alive. Being alive. Yeah. And I'm not... I don't really allow other people tell me how I have to live. Mm-hmm. I trust my inner kind of moral compass and and my kind of love of humans to guide me mm-hmm. and you know it, it's a it can be a very joyful experience being alive I mean it's not like I'm not happy all the time at all but what keeps me what floats my boat is 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 writing mm-hmm. is 
listening to myself is paying attention to my own memory and to saying it's okay to be heard. You're allowed to be heard. Mm -hmm. It's okay. And it's not rocket science, you know, writing, drawing, making work, I think is incredibly important. And it's not exclusive. People say to me, oh, I couldn't draw a straight line. But you don't need to draw a straight line. Draw whatever kind of line you like. Mm -hmm. I couldn't write a sentence. Well, you can you can talk, you yes. can think, you can remember, you can maybe gather stuff together in a scrapbook. You can stick things down. You can a, a la turn up to your own soul. Mm -hmm. You don't have to turn up to an empty page and create a book. You can just turn up to yourself. Find something that, that I always think it's kind of funny, but the, the language you use, it's about what you're describing to me is find something that you can lose yourself in. Yeah, it's, 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 find it's something kind of to like get an, lost in. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it sounds like an oxymoron, but it's yeah. actually then that is to me. That's your life. That's it's, that's, that's your freedom. That's being in that the flow. That is your freedom. That's being in the present. Yeah. yeah, yeah. People who are battered from one end of the week to the other by other people's needs. Man, I feel it. I feel it. I, you know, I'm talking from a point of real privilege. Mm -hmm. I'm talking from being 50, whatever. Yeah. And having a secure home. I have a home. I'm in a marriage that I, I want to be in um, with somebody that I want to be with. Those things are seriously lucky. Mm -hmm. They're man. They're, those are really great things to be. You know, that's a great playground to yeah. be operating in. I hope you enjoyed listening to Hillary as much as I enjoyed chatting to her. Thank you for tuning in. Hillary's first novel, The Weight of Love, published by Penguin Books, is out in March 2020. To quote Hillary again, memory is all we have, so it's really worth making the most of it. For regular updates and bonus material, follow Superbrain Podcast on Instagram and at Sabina underscore Brennan on Twitter. Subscribe to Superbrain on Apple, Spotify, Google, Acast or wherever you consume your podcasts. And remember, if you love it, rate it, review it, share it. My name is Sabina Brennan and you've been listening to Superbrain, the podcast for everyone with a brain. <laughs>